Welcome everybody to today's topic, which is do you have guilt or shame around being sensitive or some of your sensitive needs? I'm here with Willow McIntosh. Willow, so welcome everybody. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me, Jude. It's wonderful to be here. <laughs> so good to see you guys. I love seeing the, the little boxes of all the people joining us live right now on the sensitive empowerment community. So I really want to especially welcome you guys for being with us live today. This is kind of a really interesting topic because one of the reasons I picked it was because I see the words guilt and shame come up a lot in the community in some of our discussions. And it got me thinking about, we haven't really done one that's specifically about this. And I really want it to be about our feelings around sensitivity. And that I know so many of us, including myself, uh, I know I used to have a lot of guilt and shame around sensitivity and around my needs. I used to feel like I had to hide how sensitive I was. I used to feel like I didn't want to be a burden to people with some of my special needs that I had, if I needed something to be different than other people around me, it was really hard. It took a while to get into the process of really learning to love and accept my sensitivity. But I've also noticed that for a lot of people, guilt and shame are like the last things to go. Have you noticed that, Willow? Yes, absolutely, yeah. And uh, I'm so pleased that we're, we're discussing this today. Yes, I think it's, goodness me, it's such an important area to discuss. And you're absolutely right. I think that that shame and that guilt, you know, it's deep seated and it's something that must be addressed. And of course, it's not something that should naturally be there. There should be, you know, there should be celebration of the trade. There's no need for us to feel guilty or shame around it. However, I have a great deal of compassion for us, the fact that we that we do feel that. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's because we feel different. And as children, we weren't taught necessarily how to ask for our sensitive needs. We kind of had to work it out as an adult. And sometimes it's easier to kind of stay quiet and not speak up. Um, and so it's a really important area to address. What were some of your personal experiences with guilt and shame in, in like your early life before you kind of did all this work around it? That's a very good question. So my experience around shame and guilt, when I was little, there was a great deal of shame in me around who I knew I was inside. So as a child, I had a, a real awareness that I saw the world in a different way and that I was having quite a profound experience as a child the way that I was, um, you know, experiencing my own senses and the people around me. And it wasn't in my childhood experience, it wasn't safe for me to express myself and be myself. So I developed a great deal of shame and guilt around the, the feeling of me, the feeling of being able to express myself. And I think for me, actually, it was a, a, around my creativity. It was around my enthusiasm for the world and my sense of adventure. I'm a, I'm a high sensation seeking HSP. And my energy was quite big as a child. Like I was really curious and I was um, you know, fascinated by so many things around me. And I think, to be honest, I was a bit of a handful as a child. Um, and so that tended to be, that energy was kind of squashed in me. Um, so that was my experience. There definitely was the part as, as I became an adult of, you know, um, expressing my needs as a child, um, expressing my needs as an HSP. But for me, uh, um, as a child, it was all about not feeling safe to really express myself. Yeah, it's, it's so sad that so many of us have been walking around like that. I think as we spend time together, we just see how beautiful this trade is and um, and I have kind of a list that would be kind of interesting to, to read through of things that HSPs have said that they're feeling guilt and shame around. And definitely those joining us live can put that in the chat too. Mary Ellen is saying, um, and I've heard other people say the same thing, that there's um, guilt around asking people to not wear fragrance and also um, needing to ask coworkers not to use room fragrance either. And I've actually heard this a lot from a lot of HSPs being so impacted by smell um, and scents that, you know, so much so that we can get headaches and sick from some of these scents. 
and there's a there's a real push to have people have like fragrance free offices, for example, like therapists, if you're listening and you're working with HSPs, which most likely you are, since about 50% of your clients are HSPs um, or more. Um, and here are some of the other ones too that I wanna kind of walk, walk you through that some HSPs have shared. Uh, guilt about being an inconvenience um, to family and others when you have to ask for needs that are different than the majority. And you guys let me know too, if these are things that you resonate with. Um, and guilt around boundaries, that's a big one, like especially with family that um, that is toxic. There's a lot of guilt around trying to set boundaries. Um, shame for not being stoic and letting things impact me emotionally, that came up. Um, some people shared that they were made fun of as a kid for being so sensitive you know, really harsh language, like being called a cry baby, which is horrible um, that people are even saying that. Uh, guilt around uh, when you have to cancel plans. Oh, that was a big one for me too. Uh, or ask for special accommodations and maybe having like a narrow window of comfort around like hot, cold smells and odors, noises. Um, and some people even sharing that, um, you know, they, they feel like they have to have things their way. Like people say, oh, you know, she always has to have things her way. And, and that's, we have to reframe that because, you know, I think about myself, for example, when I, um, like if I was at a restaurant and somebody was, if, if there's a bright window, um, it would be difficult for me to have the window behind the person and, and um, because of the bright light while I'm trying to look at the person little things like that. So if I'm requesting to shift and somebody sees that as, um, you know, as, as a way of me having my way, we really got to look at this in a different way. This is really about accommodating needs. Um, shame around uh, showing and revealing how sensitive we are. That was a big one for me too. I used to really feel like I had to hide that about me um, before I did my work, my personal work feeling embarrassed about being too sensitive. How many times have we been called too sensitive? Uh, feeling embarrassed about needing to do things differently. That's something that came up a lot. Um, and shame for being able to pick up on other people's energies. Like, especially a lot of people talked about that in the community as when they were kids, they, they would pick up on stuff, but uh, others around them either didn't believe them or they would say things like you're jumping to conclusions and you don't have evidence. And so then, we're, you know, we're walking around questioning ourselves and our experiences, which is really confusing. Isn't that interesting, Willow? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Th those are some really good examples. And um, there's one other that I was, uh, that came up to me, came, uh, came to me there was, was around shame around the, the depth of feeling that we have, you know, where it was kind of mentioned it there in terms of being, you know, being too sensitive. But one thing I used to really find when I was younger is how much um, I would feel something and I would react to that in the way that I would respond, you know, um, whether it was something good or something bad. And I think that, that depth of kind of experience that we have in terms of our feelings, I think there can be a lot of a shame around that, that we feel that we can't really communicate how we're really feeling about something because we, we get that sense that you know it's not going to be accepted or it's not going to be the right way to feel about something yeah it's so wrong and sad that that sense of people are walking around experiencing this because you know we don't think about that if a diabetic needs insulin or somebody in a wheelchair needs a ramp <laughs> you know it's like we we have to look at this in a different way which is why i've really spent a lot of time recently talking about sensory overload and we didn't we did an episode about that because I, I want people to be educated that these are real experiences for us. This isn't just like, oh, I don't like that smell. These are, you know, people having real experiences physically where it's making them sick. Um, and the emotional part, it's like, we need emotional people in the world. We need deep feelers and deep carers and people that are empathetic. And we have to change these messages. And it really starts within ourselves. Because if we're thinking that about ourselves, because this is definitely my experience, and you can tell me, Willow, if you've shared this, that when I walked around thinking there was something wrong with me, you know, when I was a kid, my, I was, I, I'm so sensitive that I was impacted by everything all the time. Like I would catch 
anything that was going around and I would get weird stuff. I'd be ill with weird stuff. And, and so I really got this um, message that, you know, Julie's really fragile. She's really weak. There's something wrong with her. She's too sensitive. So there was, I, I really was raised with that feeling that, oh, wow, there's something really wrong with me. And if I hadn't have done my own personal work and really educated myself about this trait to understand, it's like, oh, that's the reason, you know, now I know how to take care of myself. So I'm not sick all the time and I'm not catching <laughs> everything around me all the time. But the emotional part is such a big one. And I see a lot of people in the community saying the same thing. Um, you know, Willow, it's like, I think the messaging that we're giving to the world is so important that um, HSPs are, you know, we're created for a reason. There's a reason why we have this sensitivity. We pick up on more data. We have more information. You know, we can tell what's happening before others can tell. These are all really important things. And being deep feelers are needed. Like we need you in lawmaking. <laughs> we need you in policymaking, in the education medical system, psychology programs. We need deep feelers, people who really have a lot of empathy for others. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that really makes the, the difference for everything. And I, you know, I know it's an area that, um, that we, we touch on a lot, but I think it's really, really important to recognize that the reason we have these differences and the reason that we experience the world in the way we do is because of, there's, there's an intended purpose to it. You know, it, as, as you say, in various different professions and um, um, places that we are really needed around the world, we need that extra level of sensitivity. We need to be able to you know, do the work that we need to do at the level we do. And that requires us to, to have these, these sensitivities. I, I think a, an important area around this is actually finding the right language to communicate our needs. Because I think a lot of the fear in us comes like, you know, we don't want to rock the boat. Like if people are out together having fun and we're part of a group and we're feeling overwhelmed, we don't want to be the one that kind of stands up and goes, oh, I, I need to rest or, you know, and um, that's that's a bad example because we shouldn't be you know um, it, there needs to be an honoring of our needs and there's a way to communicate that so but I think that I think sometimes we fear like you know oh, I'm just gonna am I gonna let people down if I actually share my needs right now and I think that sometimes we, we have that fear so I think it's about recognizing how and when to communicate our needs and whether we actually need to communicate or whether we can just go and look after ourselves and do what we need to do. So I think there's an area around that that's uh, worth uh, looking at. Yeah, and I, I often think about, you know, so much comes from within ourselves because if I'm feeling that there's something wrong with me for having that need or for being that deep feeler, for being impacted more than others around me, then I already have a bucket full of that inside of me. And so somebody's comment is just putting a drop inside my already full bucket and now it's overflowing and now it's a problem. But if I don't have an already full bucket, if my bucket is empty and people put drops into it, it's not going to impact me as much. And what I mean by empty is to recognize that, you know, this is a real thing for us, that this to, to understand yourself and your sensory system and your emotional brain and all of that is such an important part so that we understand and we're making requests and we're advocating from a place that feels educated and strong and empowered and not from a place of, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to ask this or something wrong with me. And I'm afraid to ask that now I'm projecting that kind of energy also, you know, and I definitely recognize that this is hard to do, especially when we're young which is why we need to get parents educated about this trait more and more too. Um, and, and even for, if we have children to educate and advocate for our children. But you know, part of supporting children and HSPs in general is being aware that these are real experiences for us. And, um, you know, and it's in little things like, I'm trying to think of some personal examples too, like, um, uh, when I spend time with my partner, for example, she really likes to have a lot of fans on all the time. And sometimes I'm okay with that, but sometimes the fan, the noise of the fan can impact me, especially if maybe I'm trying to watch TV and then there's a noise of the fan. And so we have to find what's going to work. It's like, okay, we're going to get a quieter fan. Maybe we're going to put it on the low setting <laughs> instead of the high setting or, you know, just little things. And I just remember I, that there used to be so many things I used to feel 
so you know bad about personally that things would affect me like even the the softness of the sheets like i'm incredibly sensitive to how soft the sheets are and what they've got those like pills on them you know on the sheet i just can't stand it in a sensory way and uh, that used to be something maybe i would hide and i not would want to tell people but now i'm like oh okay you know that's a sensory experience that i'm having so so i'm empowered in my in my request and my advocacy personally now because I understand it. Beautiful. Wow. So well said. I couldn't agree more. Yes, absolutely. I think there it, when when there is that shift into ownership in ourselves that this is who I am, these are the needs that I have. There's an amazing reason why I have these needs because I'm, you know, I have these wonderful abilities and I'm here for important things in the world. And I think from there, you know, as you've just said, you, you know, our needs then come from a place of, of empowered knowing within us that this is just a part of who we are. And I think when that gets um, handed into parenting, which, are, which is happening more and more now, I think those needs then become normalized in children. So, you know, a high sensory child then is able to recognize that they have these needs and there's nothing wrong with that and so therefore the way that they communicate that need is then received in a very different way so it's not coming from this place of like oh my gosh i'm going to rock the boat it's coming from this place of oh, i need to rest <laughs> or, or, or you know, however a child would do it in a way that's confident and kind of knowing or without that sense of shame um i think that i think that's coming in parenting but i think it's that ownership and normalizing that that sends us sends us in the right direction yeah, that's so interesting to talk about this and normalize it. And I, I feel like we're going to change lives talking about this and, and being together, um, really normalizing this. Another thing that's for me personally is when I have people come stay with me. Um, so like when my mom comes to visit or something and maybe she'll stay a, a seven to 10 days or something, um, I need so much downtime that I, and I used to force myself to like, just be with her all day long. <laughs> and I would, I would really feel sick by the end of the day. If I didn't get my alone time, we talk about this a lot as an, a necessary need for us. And, you know, so it was really empowering for me to finally be able to explain to her when she comes to visit to say, you know, I'm probably going to be going and doing, you know, meditation and taking a bath and, um, relaxing, maybe even a nap if I need it, something in the afternoon, I'll rejoin you again at dinner, you know, and, and things like that really made a huge difference. So I wasn't like falling apart sick at the end of every one of those visits that I would give myself that time and not skip my self-care. Cause I know a lot of us tend to do that when things get busy or we have company or we're traveling or whatever, that we start to skip it. And then we really start to suffer, but being able to say it, you know, like I said before, I would have felt really um, like something was wrong with me for saying that, and, oh, I'm going to disappoint her that I'm not going to be with her all day long. Um, and it would just create this uh, just enormous stress inside of me because I knew it wasn't feeling good to me, but to be able to just be that matter of fact about it, to say, this is what my need is, and this is what I'm going to do. Um, and then the time that I'm spending with her is so much better because I've had my downtime and I've had my rest. Um, so little things like that. And even in my own friendships, um, you know, there's a, a lot of talk about how maybe we we make plans when we're like a hundred points of energy and we're just have a bunch of energy and we're like, yes, that sounds really fun. And then the, the event comes up and we're like totally tired and depleted. And we're like, Oh, why did I say yes to that? You know, or whatever it is that, um, in my friendships, we, we talk about that together and we have it very clear that we at any point can cancel on each other. And it is, we know that it's because that one of us is taking care of our needs or our self-care and it's totally okay. And it doesn't impact our friendship because we've had these conversations. Um, so things like that are, are really helpful to kind of incorporate in your life. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's another re really key area. It's helping the other person to know that it's not them. There's nothing wrong with them that we are needing these periods of rest or whatever it is. I used to find that in earlier friendships it, is if I would go and rest, the person would think, well, what have I done wrong? Why are you going? Like, what, what, <laughs> what, what, is this something I said? You know, and it's like, no, 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 it's something you said, you know, and, and soon, you know, I was able to communicate that actually when I, when I do rest, I'm going to be a lot more entertaining and I'm going to be a lot more focused and I'm going to be there for you, you know, in the way that you really expect. I think sometimes when you take yourself away, there's that voice like, 
I was really enjoying your company. Like, where are you going? And, and then that shame, I think, can come. We think, oh, God, I'm letting that person down. So by communicating just in the way that you've shared there, Julie, and, and really helping them understand this is not about anything to do with them. In, you know, this is not about a, a, some, a wrongdoing. It's just, it's just a, a, a sensory need, a sensory overload need. I love that, Willow. That's a good example because that's true. The, the other part, if you're able to communicate that, you know, you're really important to me. I love to spend time with you, but this is how my system is set up that I'm going to need to meditate and have some rest and some downtime. And then I'm going to really enjoy your company later, you know, or something like that where you're expressing to them uh, not only what your needs are, but also that they're really important to you. And this isn't about you, you know, needing to get away from them. It makes me think about as a kid, uh, back when I think when I think about my dad, I think maybe he was an HSP. Um, because he used to, uh, we'd be, you know, maybe a family gathering or go over to somebody's house or something, he would always just disappear in the middle of stuff. And you'd find him laying down napping on somebody's couch or something It was like, what, where'd he go? And my mom would get like so mad at him. But, you know, I look back on that and I was like, he was always somebody that just kind of did what he needed to do. And I actually kind of respect that now, now that I see what he was doing, as I look back on it, it's like he needed his rest and he went and took it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah. And it's really interesting that we were talking about cats as well earlier on. It's, cats are really like that. Like they really tend to their needs. Like, you know, if you call them and they're not interested, they're, they're not interested. And if they, you know, if they need to rest or they need to eat, whatever they need to do, they do it without questioning it. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think there's something really beautiful to be learned from that, you know, obviously to communicate it in the right way, but just to really honor the fact that, you know, the need is there. Uh, oh, I my think. God, I love it. I see Julia laughing, too. Yeah, that is so funny and so true. And we don't like think there's something wrong with a cat for doing that. They're just like, OK, they're done with, you know, being pet and now they're going to go sleep. And it's like not a big deal. We don't judge it. Um, mm. <laughs> Yeah, there's no there's no shame in the cat. You know, the cat doesn't think, oh, gosh, I feel a bit bad. Sorry, I need to go and uh, I need to go and do this now. You know, I, I, think, that example. Yeah, I love that we had like those few minutes before we record to like see each other's cats. That's kind of fun. <laughs> we're gonna to have to do that on the next live event too. It's like everybody bring your cats into the video so we can see them or your dogs. So cute. I like that example, Willow. That is so funny. You know, it's it's true. I actually like to think about our, us in terms of nature, you know, and how accepting we are of the different changes and seasons and transitions of nature. And if we could really think of ourselves in that kind of way too, I think it could be kind of powerful, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, to be aware of the, you know, the changing seasons in our in our bodies. And, and also, you know, the changing needs that we have throughout the day, like, you know, tuning into when we have that, the higher levels of energy and when we don't and, and you know, organizing our self-care needs around that awareness, you, you know, we can do that on a day-to-day -day basis and we can obviously do that on a, on a seasonal basis as well. Yeah, and anybody in the, that's with us live right now, if you want to ask any specific questions or comments, please put them in the chat now with uh, our names too. I have to read what Gracie said because it cracks me up. Gracie, you always make me laugh. I love it. Uh, she says, all I ever, all I ever really needed to know in life, I learned from my cats. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> so good. Yeah. I oh totally my agree. gosh. Yeah, I love totally. it. Actually, there's another, there's another really key thing I learned from my own cat as well is, is how um, she doesn't take things seriously. And, and it just, I mean, obviously she takes some things seriously, but she's very good at kind of breaking my mood sometimes if I'm taking something too seriously. And I think that's actually quite an important piece for us as, as HSP. If sometimes we do take, well, I know that a lot of the time we take ourselves really seriously. And I think sometimes we over we over kind of need our needs in some ways, like we make too much of a thing of them sometimes. And we think, you know, I've got to have this need met. And like, if anyone doesn't understand then, you know, and we kind of get, sometimes we get a bit militant around it. And, and I totally understand that because, you know, from our point of view, we think, well, I need you to understand my needs. This is very important to me. And if I don't get that, then I'm really going to struggle. So, you know, I, th I think there is that importance to it, but I think also it does help us just to kind of smile a bit internally and, and know that you know we can ask for our needs to be met 
from ourselves and for others to understand in a way that can be more playful and a bit creative in some ways. And we can just take away that stress factor around it a bit. That's huge, because I think that's the, as you guys often hear me say that the issue is five pounds, but if we're really judging it, it's a thousand pounds. Uh, so if you can really do that self acceptance and self advocacy and Tina was sharing in the chat that even little things that you know that she's doing is she moves her appointments when she can to the afternoon so that she can have slow mornings because slow mornings is a lot of what we talk about and part of our wellness is HSP is just not having to race out of bed into do, you know, to do mode, but having that time to kind of slowly move into the day is really supportive. That's awesome, Tina, that you were able to do that. Yeah. Okay, let's see, we got a question here. Shan says, Julian Willow, any tips to stop the compulsion to explain or even over explain? Oh, that's a good question. I think that the, the over explaining is really coming from um, the fact that we're not accepting it inside of ourselves. So it's a bit of a defensiveness. Like I gotta, I gotta make sure that they, you know, part of it too is that it's coming from a place of needing them to accept you, needing them to agree with you needing them to be okay with you. Notice how all of that is external focus. And I think the important thing is, because we waste a lot of energy, all of us do that as HSPs on this external focus of how's everybody viewing me? Are they going to judge me? But if I bring that back in, and, and I've done the same thing. And for me, it's like this, um, I had to train myself through, if you have that split moment of, oh, are they going to think something bad about me? I bring that into my focus, into my internal focus to be able to say, this is important for my needs. And it's important that I pay attention to my inner child and not ignore what her needs are. And then I instantly start to feel better because I'm realizing I'm doing this as a part of my well being. What do you think, Willow? Well, I love that. Yeah, I love that. Yes, I think this, that's a really, really good question. I think, yes, there's definitely a tendency in us to, to over explain. I think you're right on the money there, Julia. I think, I think it is about the fear that if we don't go on and on about it, then someone's not going to really trust that we know what we're talking about. And actually, if we know that we, it's really interesting. It's a bit, it's a bit of a paradox for us as HSPs, because actually we're very knowing people. We, we are very intuitive and we often really know what we're talking about. And I think it's it's the fear that we're not going to be we're not going to be acknowledged or it's not going to be accepted in some way, and then we kind of overdo it and we talk about it too much. But there's also a part around the the passion that we have for communicating and teaching and sharing. You know, we're amazing teachers, advisors, consultants, and I think there is that tendency to want to share and to teach. But but I think you're right there, Julie. It's about tuning into, <clears throat> you know, what am, what do I really know about this? What are my needs right here? And you know, checking in with ourselves, what's actually happening? Why am I over talking right now? Yes, I think that's a big one. You know, we are part of the trait too, is that, you know, and from the ancestors that passed down to us is that we need to fit in. And that we, when, you know, when we were living outdoors and, you know, out on the land, we couldn't survive on our own and we needed to fit into the group to survive. So that's a part of who we are, this feeling of constantly needing to fit in and to feel this sense of acceptance. And, but, but I, I don't want to say that that's not something that we need, but I want to say, be careful about who you're trying to get to accept you, you know, because we talk about this a lot in the sensitive empowerment community. We, we feel accepted here. It's not a, it's not a challenge to be accepted when you're amongst other HSPs. So have other HSPs in your life um, and be able to receive the acceptance from, from that, because that's a, you know, it's important that you're not wasting a lot of energy on trying to get somebody to accept you who just isn't going to. And, in, you know, when we think about it, it doesn't really matter if somebody's a, a, going to agree with us or not. It's like, I have a choice in that moment. Am I going to please that person and give up my own needs, which means I'm giving up my wellness? just so that person is somehow happy, but are they really happy? <laughs> because it's like, we don't, we can't, we can't please people. It's, it's actually not possible to do that, that it's important that we're showing up as the highest level of ourselves. And we actually had some conversations in the community about guilt and shame and some really kind of aha moments went off for a lot of us in this discussion 
about, you know, maybe guilt around, we were talking specifically around how hard it is to set boundaries around toxic family, siblings, parents, whatever it is. Um, and yet we were realizing that if we're putting a lot of energy into toxic relationships and we're all kind of falling apart doing that, our light is going dim. And we, don't, we can't have our light go dim in the world. We're needed in the world. And we need you to be your strongest, healthiest, most balanced, well self so that you are able to shine your light brightly in the world because we need that from you. And then you're also able to connect deeply to relationships and positive people in your life when you're able to set those kinds of boundaries. So it was a kind of a powerful thing to start talking about, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. I really like that. That's such an important awareness. It's tuning in. Am I trying to explain something to someone when actually I really don't need to do that? And am I trying to persuade someone of something that I already know that they're never really going to get and I don't need them to get it? So I love that. You know, I'll, if we are if we if if we are trying if we if we're losing energy trying to raise people around us, or you know, do we really need to be doing that? And, and without this sounding derogatory in any way, I'm not talking about friends and family here at all. But there's a, there's a there's a there's a phrase I really like, which says that even a wise man looks silly among fools, and and there's something in that because like if we are trying our desperately to try and persuade people around us that we are this and we're that and we feel this you know this call to be validated and accepted, but it's by totally the wrong people around us or the people that are never going to get us. Not to say that those people are fools, but if they're if they're different to us, they're vibrating at a different level. It's not our responsibility to try to get them to understand or accept us. We need to be around people who do understand and accept us naturally. And there's much less expending of energy in those circumstances. Yeah, uh, totally. And you know, so we. How do we decide who we're sharing some of this stuff with? I, I want. I, I do think that over explaining comes from a defensive place of trying to get somebody to agree with us or to accept us. But if we have people in our life that we that are receptive to learning about us, you know, sure, explain to them. To, you know, share what it means to you when you have to when you go and have your alone time, when you meditate, when you're resting, when you're setting these boundaries around toxic family, whatever you're doing explain it from a place that's got that self-acceptance and empowerment attached to it and then let it go release it and we talked about this feeling of even with toxic family that you could you know release them with loving energy so that you're not feeling like harsh about it you're just like I, i'm sending them loving energy but from over here because i need to make sure that i'm protecting myself and how do i know what's toxic you know maybe it's when you spend time with certain people pay attention to how you're feeling like that do you just feel awful and exhausted and depleted do you feel dread when you're around them do you feel just icky inside every time you've spent time with them and we also talked about something important because especially when it comes to family stuff that a lot of times we're actually the reason it's so hard I and mean, we talked about some people that have been going through this you know these boundaries for so many years and then you know we talked about how um, it's like we're wishing they were a certain way and we keep on wishing that they're that way, right? We go back and forth and we're like, you know, it's going to be different this time. I'm going to spend time with them. It's going to be totally fun. We're going to have fun. And then you go back into it and it's that toxic energy again. So you're always, it's natural to wish that it was different. And, and you also might even go through a bit of a grieving process when you're making some of these transitions. But a lot of times, the grief is around what you wished it was more than what it actually was. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well said, well said. I think this is, um, this is a really important area. <clears throat> are we trying to persuade ourselves that, or are we trying to make parts of our lives work that are not meant for us to make them work? And are we feeling shame completely unnecessarily? You know, are, are we are we ending up in a pickle about our needs or about relationships and we're feeling shame about expressing our needs when actually, you know, there there really is no need for us to do that. It's are we expending energy in completely the wrong areas? I think it's really important to, to tune into that. Yeah, your energy is so precious as, as a sensitive person, too, and you don't have a lot to spare to waste. So you really want to be intentional about where that goes. 
Minerva says, uh, love it, Julie. I'd rather invest my energy in my own needs, not in the expectations of the outside world. Well said. I like that, right? Invest Brilliant. your energy into your own needs and your own well-being. And you're, you are going to be able to do greater things in the world than, than fall apart from toxic energy. Um, and I have, a, I want to go through to a list of, um, I'm going through some of what people have said too, uh, of, of kind of like ways that we might um, look at helping ourselves through guilt and shame. So it, we start with acknowledging, normalizing and validating our experiences. These are huge. We need to acknowledge that it's there. We need to normalize it for ourselves and we need to validate it. And we want to learn about your positive gifts of the trait of high sensitivity. You really wanna learn about how many positive things come with this trait. And if I, I feel kind of like we're sort of on, there's like a spectrum and some of us have started at the place that thinks that there's nothing positive about it. And we might have to move a little bit on the spectrum as we learn. And then we maybe go all the way to the end where we realize like, that's where I am. I started probably at the very end of the spectrum where I thought everything was wrong with sensitivity within myself. And as I learned about it and spent time with other sensitive people and did my own personal work, I, I was able to learn about all these positive gifts that come with this trait. And I think that's really important and it helps us feel empowered and, and kind of stronger in our advocacy too, if we're aware of these positive gifts. We want to practice self-compassion. That's a huge one. We talk a lot about that, but it is really huge. How are you talking to yourself? Are you sending yourself loving, compassionate, supportive energy? Are you a kind friend to yourself when you need it the most every day? In fact, this is something really big and it helps you be more resilient too. You know, if you're worrying about if somebody's accepting you or not, but you go into a self-compassion place and you're like, you know what? I'm doing this because this is how I'm at my highest level of wellness. That's an empowered way to experience it and to make sure that you're giving yourself that self-compassion. Set boundaries, redirect to internal focus, like we were talking about, to help you get rid of the guilt. Remind yourself that you had to set a boundary or you had to say no, because you need to remember your inner child's needs. This is a big one. We have, who else is paying attention to your inner child, but you? Um, we want to know that when we give up our needs, we don't thrive and that's not good for anyone. So think about that for a moment. That was a big one for me to think about that. When I'm giving up my needs, I'm not thriving and that's not good for anyone. I'm not the parent I wanna be. I'm not able to do the things that are important to me in the world about helping others. Um, and so this goes even beyond me when I'm at my highest level of wellness um, and shift your mindset that it's, it's not possible to please everyone. It's just not possible. And it's going to be a lot of wasted energy. It's not your job to please others. It's their job to please themselves. And it's your job to please you. And what I mean by that is really meet your needs for your highest level of wellness Surround yourself with people who support you and limit or let go of those that don't. Um, and know that this sensitive empowerment community supports you and, and who you are and what your needs are. I just want everybody to know that there are places like this for you that are here to support you for exactly who you are. Part of our mission in this community is that we really believe in living an authentic experience and really, um, really finding true lasting self-love self-compassion understanding ourselves and and being at you know really living to the highest level of our potential in life too because the world needs you um, and be intentional about um, giving time to consciously shift some of these things like really put time in it, into it journal talk about it with a therapist work on on some of this really intentionally because it's going to make a lasting impact on your life because guilt and shame drain a lot of energy and they dim our light. Seek out support um, from an HSP psychotherapist or healer. We are, I love that we have an HSP practitioner's directory on my website. So you can actually find an HSP to work with, which is really special to be able to work with another HSP who, who gets it. 
who understands what it's like to be sensitive in the world um, and keep practicing. Finally, that's what we're going to say is keep practicing. The more you practice, the easier it gets to release guilt and shame. So really think about that. Some of the things that we've talked about today in your intentional practice. What do you think, Willow? I love it. What amazing points. Those are so, so good. So good. There was one piece that, that jumped out at me there, which I think really helps us to make a shift around this area. And that is, it, it's around value. It's around, am I valuing myself as a person in this world? And I, and, and helping us to recognize, you know, the, the, the message that Julie and I, we're, we're, we're sharing so often is, is around the importance that we play in the world as HSPs. I think once we start to really just spend time tuning in and turning, thinking my value here is important. The way I see the world's important. The things I care about are important. The, the values that I have are important. And I think, I think as we start to make that, that internal shift into a sense of value, we really find the courage and the, the reason for, for standing up for ourselves or, or speaking up for ourselves and really, you know, really uh, owning, our, owning our needs. Oh, I love that, Willow. Yes, realize your value and the value of this trait. That's huge and such an important thing. And we see that, Willow, all the time in our work. It's like when you see HSPs really kind of putting those pieces together that we've all had to put together, these pieces of self-worth and self-value and self-compassion, all these things. What happens, Willow, right, when HSPs do this? They usually are doing pretty amazing things in the world in terms of they're making the world a better place because that's just what HSPs do. And that's what, you know, we need your bright light. We need you to know that you're valuable. We need you to know that you are not too sensitive. Everyone listen to this and let's all say it together. <laughs> you are not too sensitive. <laughs> it's that the world is too loud and busy and chaotic and not set up for sensitive people, but there is nothing wrong with you and that you have so much value in the world. I just want everybody to, to maybe just take a moment. Let's just close our eyes for a moment. And I want us to just really soak that in. And I want everybody to say together to yourself, I have value. I have value and I have worth and I am important in this world and that I am sensitive for a reason because sensitivity comes with so many gifts. It makes me caring and empathetic and I am here as a bright light to make a difference in the world. And I start within myself of really valuing and honoring who I am including my sensitivity and my needs. And I want to send that kind of energy out to everybody that's listening, that you are so valuable. Let's just take a nice big deep breath together and let's just soak in that energy as we are together, just in that energy right now, just feel that and know. I mean, you can see that when we're together, when we are sensitive people together, we feel that. We adore other sensitive people because we see how beautiful and wonderful and kind hearted they are. That is you. You are that person. You are that person who cares and who's needed in the world. And I really want you to hear that message. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you, Julie. That was so lovely. As you were doing that, I, was, I visualized the globe and I saw all of the HSPs ignite like mini candles all around the world in their light and brightness wow gosh that's beautiful willow just imagine if we bring in that energy together every every time we every day just imagine that and and think about your value in the world and i i just want to say thank you to everybody joining us live today and uh we just have so much fun being together in this energetic space and I know, Willow, you have you do so many things that are so important to the world, and you're really helping a lot of HSP coaches get out there, put themselves out there because of that light that they have inside of them, helping them find what they are passionate about, what they're meant to be doing. Um, and so tell people how they can find you and what you recommend they look for when they're going to your website. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so 
So, so many of us as, as high sensory people, as I like to call us, have a calling to want to coach others, to coach, to consult, to create healing and transformation in others. We're so good at doing that. And that's one of the key areas that I specialize in. I have a, a coaching program that really helps us to embrace these, these high sensory gifts that we have. Uh, the fact that we have our own innate methodologies and that we have our own area of expertise as a result of our own life path. And there is a process that can help us to really claim ownership of that. And if it, it's there on the highsensoryintelligence.com website, um, if you reach out to us on there, there's a page with information about the training. And I would love to have a call with you. If you book in a call, I can just chat with you about it, no obligation. And just my, my passion is about helping you to really recognize the, the amazing abilities and gifts that you have to create change in others. So it's all That's there. That's beautiful. Grace is saying Willow's program is fantastic, absolutely life-changing. I believe it, Willow. You've got a beautiful heart. And I know you're out there helping a lot of people. And you know, for people just to know that there's a lot of really um, beautiful HSPs out there for you, whether it's Willow and you want to go into, you know, the, into really being able to share your light in the world, um, and other HSP practitioners, that's like such a big deal too. It's like, we're, there's so many HSPs out there that, that are, that have gone through this process that have, are, and are able to teach you some of what they've learned and how to support you through the world. And, and it's just such an important piece. And I'm super excited. I'm working on a new course that's, that's soon to be released. And it's going to be kind of like an HSP toolbox of all kinds of tools that, that I use and other HSPs use. Um, to really help us thrive to the fullest potential. So I'm very excited about that. And you can really check out all my courses at hspcourse.com for anybody that wants to take an online course. We've put a lot of um, what we've learned over the years into these courses to support your well being. And of course, come join our sensitive empowerment community. We would love to have you. We do our live events here, and it's really fun to be together and to really support and normalize and validate our experiences in the world together. Wow, I love it. Amazing. Yeah, your courses are amazing, Julia. Really, I'm so excited to hear that there's another one coming. The toolbox, that sounds really, really good. I love oh, that. So fun. It's just like I wait, you know, we talk about the downloads of intuitive downloads and stuff. I wait for these downloads to happen. And then I'm like, I become aware of like, this is what is meant, you know, this is what we need. So to be able to have a place it's like, this is what, because so many people ask me, it's like, how can you be an HSP empath and do all the stuff that you're doing? This is how I'm doing it is through these tools. This is what we teach in the sensitive empowerment community so that we can shine our lights brightly in the world and make a difference because that's what it's all about, that the world needs you. The world needs the sensitive people, bright lights, which means you have self-acceptance, and self-love and self-compassion. So keep working on those things. I really encourage everybody to listen to our previous podcast episodes too. Willow and I have covered so many topics. You can find them on any platform that you're listening to the podcast, or you can go to hsppodcast.com to see all of them in one place. You can click the button that says Julie and Willow, and then you can actually see a whole list of them that we've done. Uh, and I've heard a lot of good things from people who have heard and listened to all those episodes. So we just love you and support you in the world. And we're here for you to help your light shine bright because we need you. Beautiful. Take care out there, everyone. So good to see you. See you next time. Bye, everybody. Love you guys. Take good care of yourselves. I'll be putting this chat into uh, the community so we can read through it afterwards too and comment together. So Will and I can take a look at those comments if we missed any questions that came up. Love you guys. Take good care and we'll see you in the community. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.